Hey, I'm Josh. In this episode of Josh at Night, we'll be talking about buying, selling, and creating digital art. Enjoy the show. Hip hop hooray! Oh, hey, oh. Welcome to the Josh at Night show. Welcome. Thanks for coming to watch me talk to some pretty dope people. Dope people. Grab a seat and some snacks. Put up your feet and relax, relax. cause there's nowhere else to go. Hi, my name is Josh and this is my show. My Don't even Josh. think about touching that remote. Hi, my name is Josh, now you got your snacks, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Enjoy it. Everyone, I'm Josh Martin. You're watching Josh at Night. Today we have digital artist guest from Pretoria, South Africa, Latabo Huma. Uh, really excited to have her on because last conversation we talked about NFTs and the growth of digital art with guest Amir Carter. Uh, and we're looking to continue that conversation with Latabo specifically to discuss her specific process and uh, how she creates NFTs from the ideation of her art all the way to minting them on platforms like a super rare. Tabo, very excited to have you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, we're excited to have you. Uh, excited to learn from you and really get into the conversation. So maybe we'll just start from the top. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? I know you had the comp side background and decided to yeah. make the leap to art. Uh, maybe take us through that process. Cool. I've been a professional artist for five years. But when I began my art career, I was part-time a visual artist. I was more of a traditional artist, actually, for the first two years of my career. But yeah, like I did it on the side. And I, at the time, I was pursuing a degree in computer science. And the more I did it, the more I did it, the more I realized that the more my priorities changed. That's basically what mm-hmm. happened. Like my priorities sort of kind of changed. And I had to sort of, I got to a point where... I was committing a lot more to my art than I was like my degree. That's when I decided to go home, took a gap year. And yeah, I think in that year I sort of found, like I really dig, like I dug deep into sort of my love for art, different ways I can create. And Mm -hmm. I sort of was very drawn to, I found myself uh, very drawn to digital art. And I sort of kind of, at at the time I had already uh, sort of saved up for, a secondhand iPad at the time, but I sort of like explored more. Like I explored like a, yeah. I got like an in depth sort of um, exploration of it. Well, let, and me, like let, let me ask you it. this. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So, what what drew you to digital art and the ability to create as opposed to computer mm-hmm. science? Uh, whew. I would say. I think more than anything, I think it was just my passion. Thing is, I do love coding. I do love coding, but mm-hmm. I just love drawing more. I think. Um, I've always been um, a very crafty person. Like I've always loved making my own things. And for me, I'm a very visual person and I like things that look pretty. You know, <laughs> code doesn't really look that pretty, but it does no. some really pretty cool stuff. <laughs> for so sure. um, yeah, I think that's the main thing that really drew me into it. I think the aesthetics of it all and like just different kinds of things you can do with um, visual art. Like I think more than anything, it was just, my passion for it because growing up I did it as a hobby so whenever Mm -hmm. I felt like I I felt bored whenever I felt bored like it was something I would go to and sort of do Mm -hmm. to sort of like entertain myself it it makes sense there's a there's a lot of things to unpack there but it sounds like uh, art was kind of a release or an escape and uh, you saw that opportunity to revisit uh, something that you value throughout your life Mm -hmm. uh, and to do it in a full-time capacity as a working professional artist because you have sold art uh on on superware and things well you can you consider yourself a professional artist right at this point yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah so it makes sense uh, something i like about okay so uh full-time professional artist uh making a living doing art and i would think that when you're in the blockchain nft space you kind of get a little taste of that computer science technology as well. I mean, you are a digital artist, so every stroke you make is a series of zeros and ones, which yeah. at the end of the day is, it, you know, boils down to computer science, which is really yeah. exciting. It's, it's uh, cool how that kind of came uh, full circle. Okay, so we talked about why um, art versus computer science, and really, uh, you get a bit of both with the NFTs. Let's talk about what informs your art. You know, I've been on your website, you, you use it kind of as an emotional uh, expression of your experiences maybe could you elaborate on that yeah. what informs your art for me my work is a visual diary so I'm basically when I create I, I could say that well when I'm looking at it as a servant uh, point of view 
I'd say that I'm just merely documenting the human experience, like my own human experience. And mm -hmm. that's why like my, my work covers a very wide range of different topics. Like sometimes it's about a specific emotion that I'm going through at the moment. Sometimes it's about a life experience. Sometimes it's about me seeing someone go through something and me sort of interpreting it in my own way and how that would make me feel or how I'm assuming that person is feeling when they're experiencing that. So it's basically just a visual diary of me jotting down the human experience and everything that comes with being human and yeah. Okay, so let's, let's human experience, capturing that personal diary. Let's, let's dive into your, the first piece that you sold on Super Rare. What, what was that piece? What was that piece about? That piece was titled See No Evil. See No okay. Evil is about- well, It's a I beautiful created... piece, by the way. That's the one with the uh, the eye, the hands over the eyes, the and there's a the flower is intertwined between the fingers. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's actually quite my, my most popular um, artwork, but it's about, um, I think I created it during the times where there were a lot of uh, Black Lives Matter um, protests going on. But essentially mm -hmm. what I was trying to say with that uh, piece is that I believe we all have a moral duty to sort of dip in when someone is sort of in trouble or is going through something and you sort of are in a position of power to sort of correct that or sort of help them. So that's mm -hmm. basically what it was about, like helping out wherever you can, because I believe that that would just make the world a little bit easier for all of us and that's not just with uh it wasn't related only to race but also just and you can apply it anyway even at school when you see someone being bullied and you feel like it's wrong and you could sort of stand up to that person um you know do it i believe that 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 would make the world a little bit easier for people yeah yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, being able to use whatever platform or privilege you have to yes. make a difference when you see people doing wrong, uh, when you see injustices. So I, I like how you capture that in the kind of see no evil and working towards injustices. What was it like when you sold that piece? What what was that? You know, because that it's a, it's a nice piece. Or is it based on a smart contract, which we discussed in the previous episode, where basically you get royalties every time it's sold? Yeah, so that's how like Superior works. Like any artwork that you mint or sell on their page, you get royalties based of it. But yeah, when I got my first, um, not even like when I sold it, but when I got my first bid, like I was so excited. Yeah. Like I was, I was like, oh my God, okay, no. Like it means that they are seeing my work. Like, it's not like, you know, when you're new and I don't know, when you're new to a space and you just feel like, you're not being like acknowledged like you know what I mean so when I did get like my first my very first bid I was like oh my god I was so excited I'm like oh my god this works this actually works yeah. then I got my second um bid and then yeah and then I eventually sold it to um a collector named Nanzo Scoop and that was really that was really that was really amazing I don't, I can't find a better way to describe it, but like, I was really excited and yeah. Well, where, where were you? Were you with family? Were you hanging out with friends? What um, What does your family think about you being a professional artist? I know you've mentioned that it's not very common where you're from. Well, I was with my mom. I asked you a lot of questions. I apologize. <laughs> it's, it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I was with my mom and I had sort of like briefly explained it to her. Like I'm, not, I, I'm aware that I'm not good at explaining things, but I briefly explained it to her. And I think what also sort of helped was that my cousin is um, my older cousin, where he's quite close uh, to us and he's into like forex trading and stuff like that. So he sort of okay. explained that. So like my mom sort of got the gist of it, like just the gist, like it's like, you know, so then I sort of like sort of tried to explain it like in relation to that. And then I sort of just told her like, this is how much I made. And then I'm like, okay, let me just convert it into rent. This is how much I made. Then she's like, okay, so you can get this money. And I'm like, um, yeah, but you, do you get it now? It works. It's real. And she mm -hmm. was just like, okay. And I think she sort of like understood it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I, I think most kids, children, you know, when you're talking to your parents, your mom, they're concerned about your well-being, right? So if they think, ah, you know, I don't want you to be an artist because I don't know if you'll be able to make a living and, for, yeah. you know, uh, support yourself. Computer science is very safe uh, in terms of investing in yourself in that way, in terms of learning the craft of computer science. Uh, but as yeah. an artist, you know, there's some risks. And I think something that's really cool about the blockchain and NFTs that we discussed on previous conversations is that it provides even more access for artists to have their work uh, sold and, and viewed 
uh, when you consider the internet and how it's purchased. What, do you know where your uh, the bidders are based or located, or is it fairly um, anonymous? I, I do know. I I do my research because, like, I I really want to know like who has my work, like who bought that piece. But majority mm -hmm. of them are American. Like, I do my research. Mm -hmm. Like, I Google search and just try and find out. Like, some of them actually do follow you like before. So maybe mm -hmm. if they do, they end up placing a bid two days later, you'll be like, no, I think this person followed me. Then you'll go back and check their profile. And then sort of like, that's how I find like what they're about. But I don't have, uh, I think, I, yeah, I do know all my collectors. Like I, I've done thorough research on all of them. Some some of my bidders, I don't necessarily know them, but the, the, the people that do collect my work, I do make sure that I do know who they are and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now do you ever make with the collectors in mind? Um, you make no. you make art for yourself, yeah. Yeah, no, like no. I think this is this is a conversation that's been actually going on like recently on Twitter, like on crypto or Twitter. But like uh -huh. um, a lot of artists are feeling as though if you don't make art that looks a certain way, because there's a lot of three D art. Like I must say, there's a lot of three D art just on the NF like in the NFT space. There are a lot of three D artists, yeah. and yeah, like a lot of artists feel like they're not making the amount of money they wish to make simply because of their art style, and they feel like mm -hmm. they should tweak it a little bit. I know somebody actually suggested that you tweak your work a little bit to sort of attract collectors, and I think that is a recipe for disaster because why is I that? I feel like if you create based on what people like, then you, you 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 probably won't feel as proud as you are about your work because it's not something very personal. You're doing it to impress somebody else. And I think most of the times you won't get the reaction you think you will. I think when I also, there was, I think I did go through a phase when I started sort of creating digitally, like that first year I started creating digitally where I sort of created based on how I thought people would like my work. Like I'd be like, oh, yep, this is going to get a lot of likes. Let me do this. And I did and it mm -hmm. didn't. And that depressed me. <laughs> I was like, you guys don't yeah. like my work, but I thought you, you'd like, you know what I mean? So I think, yeah. So I think you sort of need to free yourself from that sort of thinking and just create for yourself. And I, I really believe that the right collectors will come by. And I think we all want mm -hmm. uh, the right kind of people to sort of invest in our work, basically, or invest in us as artists. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense to be authentic to your work, to attract people that are genuinely interested in you as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Uh, I want to talk about your kind of the process of being discovered and introduced to Super Rare. You talked about the onboarding process in a previous conversation that we had. What was that like? Because everyone, you can't just post, anyone can't just post on Super Rare. You have to be invited. Yeah. So how did so, you get introduced to Super Rare? What, what's that story? The way I got introduced into Super Rare was, um, well, if, well, if, let me, I think let me backtrack a bit. The the way I got like introduced into crypto art was from a friend of mine who was like a major crypto, like he's a major crypto enthusiast and he, we did Comsai together. He, yeah, he's still doing Comsai, but mm -hmm. um, we did it together and he obviously knew I was a digital artist. So when he sort of did his research and found out about it he told me about it and i was like oh wow that sounds great so then i did my own research and that's how i found super rare and that's how i found super rare um I also, I also found like some other marketplaces but they weren't really i don't know um they weren't really i think i only liked super rare at the time because um apart from uh, the ones that i did um, know about at the time they did have um, the they, they did offer they, they were the ones that offered like an application process where artists uh, yeah. get sort of like a screening thing where you have to record a video of like introducing yourself share links to your mm -hmm. work uh, work and so forth and then so I did that I applied waited for quite some time it was over a month and then mm -hmm. um, I got the email yeah no that that makes sense because uh, i've seen you know you go to open sea super rare there's a bunch of other ones you know on the metamask the web3 uh, they don't they don't always seem super legit i've tried to you know uh put some ether ethereum excuse me in my wallet and kind of go shopping and look around to see what's available in terms of artwork to collect uh and there's there's some websites where you visit and they're posting up error codes um when you're transferring or trying to log in and it's like these works cost thousands of dollars sometimes. So you, you don't want to lose your money dealing with the website that doesn't work. 
So when I see a website like Superwear, which is, is really polished, um, and, and to hear that they have an actual onboarding process for the artists that they have and bring on, uh, even how to market your work and tokenize, uh, they kind of hold your hand through the process. That makes me a little bit more confident in terms of like where to shop when I want to yeah. buy a piece of, you know, an NFT. Yeah. And I think um, there's also like a lot of, how do I put this? I think it also helps us as artists to protect like, um our name like your brand name so because like imagine now somebody else applies to super with mm-hmm. my work you understand they, because i've gone through like that application process and they know who i am they'll be like hold on we that's not your work you know what i mean so also just even even if i wasn't on the platform like because they do like they do like sort of like a thorough background check on you mm-hmm. they will make sure that you are who you say you are and that's your artwork and so forth. And I think it provides um, a great sense of protection for us um, as artists. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a whole nother thing I didn't think about because literally someone can just copy and paste your work and then pose as you tokenize it and sell it yep. as an original. Um, and then how do you prevent that from happening? What, has that happened to you personally? No, it hasn't happened. But um, if someone does, um, maybe steal your work and sort of mint it you do have like majority of these marketplaces i think i'd like to think all of them you do sort of contact them and you tell them hey this is my work and then they'll take it off the blockchain they will take it off the blockchain Mm -hmm. but yeah it hasn't really happened to me and i hope it never happens to me (laughs) yeah no that's crazy because i I didn't think about that you think about okay well there's a ton there could be a ton of digital copies but there's only one original that's actually your work people can people could potentially mint and tokenize one of those copies uh, and sell it on the blockchain. And really, if if they know that you're on super rare, you don't work with any other platforms, how would you know that your work is being sold? Is there any way oh. to, uh, there, there's no way to mark your work um, and be also, you know, notified is, is there if it shows up anywhere else? But I really think like in a traditional way, in terms of like there are a lot of copies of very popular like artworks like i think it also just boils down to if you want to collect work like you also need to sort of do your own research and sort of uh, check same way you do your own research if you were buying like an original piece by an artist like it all you know you kind of make sure that they all who they say they are and that's their work so i think it's the same with buying work on the blockchain you know just do your research on like do, do your research on like who this person is if they don't have links to their website they don't have an instagram page a twitter page you know they'll seems a little bit fishy so yeah i think always just do your own research and just check double check basically okay, well, that, yeah. that makes sense i think uh when you're buying physical arts the same way just like you said uh doing your diligence to check i think it's another reason to follow the artist on social media platforms because uh, you get some artists that are anonymous um, and you, so you don't know who they are, but yeah. they still have, they typically have official or verified, um, social media accounts that I would imagine you could just slide in the DMs and say, Hey, is this you, or is this not you? Um, and you can confirm that for yourself. I would, you know, I would think as an yeah. artist. Yeah. yeah. This is what I'm curious about. And anyone who follows along with me knows I'm really big on food. I actually, uh, have a surprise, um, piece of art that I ordered for myself for my kitchen uh, that I'll share on social media. But uh, what do you eat? What's good to eat in Pretoria, South Africa? Um, there's this, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called a kota. So it's basically a bunny cha. Like that's our like most famous type of meal. Like if you do come to Pretoria, South Africa, you have to have it. But it's basically it's, like uh-huh. they cut a piece of bread in half. So you like have the whole uh-huh. loaf and then they sort of cut the inside of the bread so they take out that part and sort of put sort of layer on chips inside sort of like that outer piece of the chips, bread like a potato like a fries yeah like fries yes fries okay. so fries <laughs> and then they put on some so we have this thing called acha it's like raw mango so like we slice up raw mango and then we like spice it up and then we put it in like oil and stuff so it's quite uh-huh. spicy. So we put that on top of the fries. Then we put cheese, mm-hmm. poloni. Um, a lot of people like eggs. You can put eggs. Like it's like sort of like a stack of different things. Oh, Some people like so patties. like bologna, like the like the lunch meat bologna. Yeah, yeah. The the you you fry it? Do you fry the bologna or no? Um, no, not really. Nah, you just okay. have it the way okay. 
we just have it that way and then you can put in some patties russian and then you put the the, the piece that you cut out on top so it's like this really huge sandwich that sounds amazing <laughs> it's, it's amazing it's amazing but okay, apart so from you that, the bread, yeah. Okay, bread. so the, I just want to recap the sandwich because it sounds delicious. Bread with bread. the chips, which are AKA fries for us fries. American viewers, and mangoes, seasoned yeah. mangoes, spiced seasoned, with yeah. oil. And then after the mangoes, we have bologna. And then after the bologna, we have cheese. what? We have cheese. And then like a Russian dressing? Um, or no. no. Um, what, what, are you, what are you? I'm sorry. Like, what do you call the 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 the, the a Vienna? It's like a Vienna. Do you guys call it Viennas? Like Vienna sausage? Yeah, like a sausage. Yes, like a oh, pork okay. sausage. Sort of, we fry it okay. and then yeah, we put that on top and then eggs and then patties if you like. And so this lettuce. sandwich is like it's a big sandwich. It's, it's really huge. <laughs> So but is there bread on top then? Is it is it yeah. is an open face sandwich? Okay, so it's bread yeah. on top. Yeah, I think uh, I really appreciate your time, Latabo. I think we learned so much about you and your process of what, how to create NFTs, the experience, what we should be worried about or concerned about as collectors. Thank you for your time. Where can people find you? I know you have your website and social media. Yeah, but those are the two ways. Um, uh, you can find me on my website at www.letabohuma.com. Or you can mm -hmm. find me on Instagram, letabohuma underscore art, or Twitter, letabohuma, at letabohuma. But yeah, those are the three places you can find me. Perfect. We will find Latabo. Uh, Latabo, thank you so much for your time. Everyone, this is thank digital you. artist uh, Latabo Huma based in Pretoria, South Africa, our first international guest on Josh at Night. <sighs> Hey everyone, I'm Josh Martin and you just watched an episode of Josh at Night. If you liked what you saw, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, uh, share your thoughts in the comments. There's a new episode dropping soon.